I often find myself more interested in and connected to spaces than people. Rather than the subject, I find the context far more interesting. Spaces are the settings of our memories, our dreams, our lives. They're the places we've been and the places we'll go. Liminal space is the space in between. If everyday reality is the show on stage, liminal space is behind the red curtain. We keep memories of liminal space stowed away in the recesses of our minds, only resurfacing under unusual circumstances. And with them, they bring a deeply uncanny feeling of a lonely, nostalgic deja vu. An unrivaled vacancy felt only in our dreams, sending us back to times long past. A school after hours. An empty highway. A playground at night. These are places from our past, the settings of our memories. Deeply uncanny, yet not completely familiar. Innocent enough when you're there in person, albeit unusual. But completely different when captured through a lens. A surge in interest in the emotional phenomenon that is liminal space has swept across the internet. It's seen in videos, forums, short stories, even video games and films. Liminal space has found a home on the internet, and with it, its signature look and feel has become iconic. Liminal space is an abstract concept, making it complicated for me to simply define. In anthropology, the word liminality is used to describe the disorientation that occurs in the middle stage of a rite of passage, marking a person's transition from one point in their life to another. Liminality derives from the Latin word limen, meaning threshold. But these tedious definitions don't do liminal space justice. There are four artists I found that illustrate elements of liminal space in their own ways. Not through words, but through photographs, brushstrokes, and colors. The first is photographer Todd Hito. In his body of work, Homes at Night, Hito shows us American suburbs after dark. Instead of photographs focused on people, Hito turned his camera to the empty spaces that implied human presence, that felt lived in like empty cars and unmade beds. The painter, Edward Hopper, captured a similar ambiance, but instead through his brush. He portrays an immense sense of isolation on his subjects through the sheer amount of space surrounding them. Whether urban or rural, Hopper's subjects have a veil of solitude and impermanence cast over them as they are encompassed by an immense canvas illustrating their surroundings more than them. In his most famous piece, Nighthawks, Hopper paints not only a diner scene with customers around a counter, but surrounding it, a massive void of negative space. Nighthawks is not framed to focus on the people, but instead the dark city that looms just outside their window. Another artist, John Register, is often compared to Hopper because of their work's similar tones and style. But by removing subjects altogether, along with his iconic use of light and negative space, Register almost invites us to take part in the paintings, to fill the void that other subjects have left behind. As Register said himself, with Hopper, you witness someone else's isolation. In my pictures, I think you, the viewer, become the isolated one. Finally, 
Although Doho Su's work vastly differs from our last three artists, as he works mainly in sculpture and installation, he is just as relevant to the conversation of liminal space. Through fabric, paper, and metal, Sa meticulously reconstructs the transitional spaces in his life, like doors, hallways, and staircases. He says he's more interested in transitional spaces than destinations because life is a passageway. We experience life through a series of spaces. In his piece, Staircase 3, Sa creates a fabric replica of a staircase that connected him and his close friend in the building where they lived. Sa's work serves as a gentle remembrance of the spaces that are important to him. When combined, Hito's, Hopper's, Registers, and Sa's work help us get a better sense of what liminal space truly is. A transitional space that implies the presence of people and pushes a strong sense of isolation onto the viewer. Their work combined aptly illustrates the feeling rather than the definition of liminal space. When we look at the liminal space photo compilations online, we can immediately see some patterns. The unusual lighting, use of negative space, lack of people, haphazard framing. These photos are as atmospheric as they are, well, amateur to any professional photographer. That isn't to say that these photographs are unintentionally captivating. They utilize the iconic aspects of liminal photography that have grown out of an amateur movement. What was once a grainy photo, re-downloaded online so many times it became virtually unrecognizable, is now an art form bleeding into other areas of the art world. Artist Hito Steil, in her article In Defense of the Poor Image, defines a poor image as an image with low resolution, an image that is equally accessible as it is low in quality. It is the ghost of an image, a preview, a thumbnail, an errant idea, an itinerant image distributed for free, squeezed through slow digital connections, compressed, reproduced, ripped, remixed, as well as copied and pasted into other channels of distribution. In the process of an image losing its quality, it creates global networks, just as it creates a shared history. By losing its visual substance, it recovers some of its political punch and creates a new aura around it. As the quality of the image thins when passed from person to person, it only grows richer in meaning and context. I imagine that in five years or so, the photos of liminal space that are so popular online will have digitally aged, noticeable when looked at, like a sculpture would wear or metal would rust. As an artist and photographer, one of my biggest influences is David Lynch. He is often credited as the master of making the usual unusual. You can see this in his works like Twin Peaks and Blue Velvet. The term Lynchian, coined by David Foster Wallace, refers to a particular kind of irony where the very macabre and the very mundane combine in such a way as to reveal the former's perpetual containment within the latter. In many ways, this is what liminal space photography aims to do. Make mundane and average spaces into liminal space by the way they're captured with the camera. Since my earliest work as a photographer, I've always had an affinity for capturing spaces. Whether I was deep in nature or exploring a city, I'd always choose the back roads, the roads less traveled. I find places with personality. I snap pictures of them and marvel in the stories they tell. So when I watched YouTuber Solar Sands video on liminal space, I was immediately hooked. I had a gut feeling this was something I wanted to seriously follow. I was halfway through my senior semester of college, 
when I made the decision to switch my thesis project and artistic focus fully to liminal space. Without thinking too much, I thought of a few places near me that I could shoot to at least get a feel for liminal photography. What I didn't expect was the intense emotional experience I was about to have. It turns out, physically being in a liminal space is kind of intense. Not only was it extremely solitary, but it was more than a little creepy at times. It was a cold and windy night, with not a soul around in the rural Pennsylvanian town that I chose to shoot in. I left that first shoot with both excitement and fearful chills. Rather than my crisp and clear camera that I use for most of my professional work, I chose to use the first camera I ever bought. It's small, entry level, and definitely doesn't shoot the sharpest photos. Since I did want to be able to make a legitimate photo series, I knew I needed to find a middle ground between the grainy and compressed photos you see online and the massively high resolution photos you'd find in an art gallery. This camera was that middle ground. I was pleasantly surprised by the eerie and unique way it captured light, lending itself perfectly for liminal space. It gained a bit of a reputation, and with it, the nickname, the Liminal Space Inator. That first shoot acted as a proof of concept. Since it went so well, it filled me with a sense of validation that I made the right choice to follow liminal space. It also had me counting the minutes until I could go out and shoot again. I knew I needed something big to make this photo series stand out, to give it an edge, and have it build to something greater than me. At the time, I was planning a trip to Pittsburgh, PA for an unrelated vacation. But coincidentally, Pittsburgh has some of the most famous dead malls in the country. Dead malls are a classic setting for liminal space, as many of them were built in the 80s and 90s, and are mostly, if not completely, abandoned. They carry a heavy, nostalgic energy while having little to no people. They were exactly what I was looking for. The weeks leading up to the trip were nerve-wracking. There was a lot riding on it. When we finally did arrive, it was a bit overwhelming, like we were about to start an uphill battle. With so many moving parts, I worried that the trip would fall apart. I was scared the malls wouldn't be what I envisioned, or even accessible at all. Some of them were completely abandoned and boarded up, having closed only months before we went. Other malls were open, but without permission to film, mall security became another issue. And uh, we were kicked out of a couple. <laughs> hey, you guys can stay filming. We'll get out. Sorry. But what I was most worried about was my own ability to be able to adapt to every given situation, good or bad, and most importantly, still shoot photos that I'd be proud of. I was ready for four stressful days, full of failure. I expected the worst, but when I was there, camera in hand, everything just fell into place.
As I reflect on my experience, I'm reminded of a quote from Edward Hopper. Great art is the outward expression of an inner life of the artist, and this inner life will result in their personal vision of the world. I think Liminal Space's true purpose is to view the past, not with a passionate longing nor a regretful scorn, but instead with a gentle remembrance of where we came from. I think that, through liminal space, we can further reflect and understand ourselves in a way we haven't before. It's a lens into our past, but the underbelly of what we remember. It's visceral and evocative, a beautiful but dark perspective of our memories. Liminal space is between what was and what's next. It's where all transformation takes place if we learn to wait and let it form us.